Right, I was talking to someone on the way in, and the person said, it's pretty hard to get your mind around some of this if you haven't had a background in it. Non-dualism, all is one. The one is beyond personality, beyond logic, beyond morality. Now, some of us have quite a track record in this area. Uh, when I got interested in spirituality as a teenager in the 70s, if you weren't going to be a Christian, this was what was novel and attractive. Some type of Hinduism or Buddhism or Taoism in some kind of an American package. Now, the story of Eastern religions is a long and complex story, and we can't do it justice. What Sire tries to deal with is one particular form of an Eastern worldview, and that is of Advaita Vedanta or non-dualistic Hinduism, sometimes called monism or oneism. Everything is divine. Everything is one. There's no duality, no diversity. That one thing is beyond language, beyond words, beyond concepts, but that one thing is the supreme thing, is, is Brahman, is God, the ultimate. Now, of course, this is an entirely different worldview than Christianity or naturalism or deism or polytheism. Why would someone be attracted to this kind of a perspective? People may be disillusioned with Western philosophy. They might think it's bankrupt, that it has no answers. And so the way of the mind, the way of uh, proofs, arguments, deduction, induction, just has you going in circles. And so the way to attain meaning is found somehow through intuition or through meditation, somehow within the self, through disciplines, not through arguments. Some people are very disillusioned with American Christianity or Christianity worldwide and are quite interested in other religions. They may have a very romantic view, an unrealistic view of the uh, religions of the East, the mystic religions of the East and so on. Moreover, since especially 1965, we've had an ex increased exposure to what you might call religious others or spiritual others because of a change in immigration policy. There was something called the Asian Exclusion Act that was on the books until 1965, which limited immigration by Asians, who often tend to be Hindus or Buddhists or Taoists or something like that. That was revoked in 1965. So we saw a flood of Asians, many of which, not all of which, were of these other religions, including a whole raft of gurus, swamis, yogis, and so on. Now, what happened in the 50s and the 60s is that Many Americans were disillusioned with Western philosophy, disillusioned with American Christianity, had a general critique of American culture as violent, militaristic, unfair, materialistic, and so on. And so the notion was, let's look elsewhere for spiritual meaning. And a lot of us in the 60s and 70s were quite caught up with this. I was rescued from all this in 1976 by a sovereign God. But if not... I may have definitely gone in that direction, continued to go in that direction, because I did for several years. Uh, not such that I was involved in any one group or any one discipline, but in my reading, my thinking, I was quite interested in Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on. And Os Guinness has a, a pretty telling and a pretty arresting image for this in his great book, The Dust of Death. He says that when you're in the jungle and it starts to get dark, you build a fire to keep the beasts away because the beasts are afraid of the bright light and heat of the fire. But as the fire dwindles throughout the night, less heat, less light, you begin to see the eyes of the creatures around you because they're not exposed by the heat. They're not afraid of the light. They're not exposed by the light and afraid of the heat, rather. And he calls this phenomenon encircling eyes. And that's really, in many ways, what has happened in the United States since around the middle of the last century. There are antecedents in the Theosophical Society, in the Transcendentalist movement, in the Spiritist movement, and so on, to undermine a basic Judeo-Christian worldview. But the onslaught, the tidal wave, came in the 50s and the 60s. And what you see, basically, is encircling eyes. Because if... The Christian presence was strong and courageous 
and intellectually and culturally engaged, even given our religious freedoms, we probably wouldn't see the incursion of Eastern spirituality to the degree that we saw it. In long ago, there was a writer named Van Balen who said that cults are the unpaid bills of the church. And I think that's, that's quite an important concept. You don't want to milk it too far. But in as much as we don't have a strong, cogent, courageous Christian presence, we leave room for other claimants, for spiritual counterfeits, for spiritual imposters. <clears throat> and this is exactly what we've seen in the 50s and 60s and 70s, such that now, in many ways, this alternative worldview, which we'll talk about more later, which is not monotheistic, is not centered on the Scripture, does not single Jesus out of the crowd, is taken for granted in our culture. It's certainly taken for granted on the Oprah Winfrey show, from what I hear. It's taken for granted in the New Age section of the bookstores, Barnes & Noble, Borders, there's a huge New Age section. In the spirituality section in general, you have books on Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, occultism, spiritism, shamanism, animism. It's not just Eastern, but much of the impetus for this other worldview came from the East to the West. And we have to have some kind of an apologetic response to it. I kind of cut my teeth on apologetics dealing with this worldview because I came out of this worldview when I converted. It wasn't clearly articulated, but I was extremely interested in occultic phenomena, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, took classes on it, was very interested in it, thought Christianity had nothing to offer. So when I became a Christian, I wanted to go back and try to figure out what this perspective had to offer, if anything. I couldn't just say, well, I don't believe it anymore, and now I believe the Bible, and that's all there is to it. I really had to go back and try to make some sense of it. And one of the things that helped me tremendously was the first edition of The Universe Next Door. This is now the fourth edition. I read the first edition, took a whole class on it, read Schaefer, read C.S. Lewis, and so on. And I started to come to the conviction that we had nothing to fear from this worldview. Nothing to fear intellectually. We did have something to fear from it spiritually. We had nothing to fear from it intellectually because it's neither true nor rational nor does it answer the deepest longings of the human condition. It thrives on deception and smoke screens and hollow promises. But spiritually, <clears throat> there's a lot to be wary of. Hence the second chapter of Confronting the New Age. And I want to summarize some of this before we get into pantheistic monism and the New Age worldview. I've tried to talk about this indirectly previously, and maybe you can give me some illustrations. But when you're trying to communicate Christianity to people, we know from Scripture there will be resistance. We know we have to put on the full armor of God. And by the way, where's the reference to the full armor of God in the Bible? Hey, very good. Very good. Okay. What are the verses? 10 through probably 18 in there. So we know... We're in some kind of a military situation. And those great old militaristic hymns are good, really. You know, Onward, Christian soldiers. Those are good hymns. Don't get rid of those. Don't expunge those. I mean, we are in a battle. It's been won already through the work of Christ, but we are his, are his agents through His power to take the truth into the world. And the world, the flesh, and the devil doesn't like it. So again, something can have plausibility but not rationality. And this basic pantheistic monistic worldview has a lot of plausibility in the West and in America. It's not rational, but people gravitate towards it. Christians start to use this language. Christians start to think in New Age categories now because they haven't been taught doctrine. They haven't been taught worldview. They haven't been taught apologetics. And so what do they do? They just gravitate with what they see on television, what they see in the movies, what they experience in video games, what they read in magazines, what they see in the newspaper. I mean, this is so a part of our culture. That what, what, what was it? I think I was watching one of the Red Sox games. I, I admit it. I watched a couple innings in one of the Red Sox games. And I saw one of the commercials. And the commercials were women getting into various yoga postures. And I think it was about the clothes they were wearing. It was just taken for granted that people practice yoga. I mean, I've seen articles in the New York Times about yoga wear. Now, yoga is intrinsically a Hindu practice. It's rooted in a non-Christian worldview. There are even Christians that talk about doing Christian yoga, which is an oxymoron. 
So it's deeply embedded in our culture. And in terms of the New Age manifestation of this, this was some of you old enough to remember, was very much in the headlines and very much on people's minds in the early to mid 80s. There are a lot of books about it, seminars, headlines. I remember being in Seattle, Washington. It was about 1986, 87. It was actually the headline of the newspaper about this New Age event that was going to be held in Seattle, in the Kingdom. And it was very much a controversy. What is the New Age? And I remember once talking to a reporter, television reporter, and I gave him a booklet, my booklet, The New Age Movement. And then that night on the television, miracles happened. And then that night on television, they described the, the New Age worldview. They took the points right out of my booklet about what the, what the New Age worldview was. Now, they didn't say it was wrong, but at least they got the basic idea right. So this was really hot in the 80s. And a lot of the ministry I did in the 80s and early 90s was related to this. Not so much anymore. It's really died down to some degree. Why? Because we defeated it? Because it blended in. Because now it's common, assumed. It's not a controversy anymore. Yes? I would argue that it's lost interest. Especially in the cosmos. It's evolved. There's no longer interest in Buddhism and hmm. all those things. I hope you're right. Uh, okay, you're right in a couple of cases. I hope you're right in terms of a general trend is what I meant. I hope you are. I, I still think people are very interested in this and entranced by it. And it's still very much an issue we have to face. It may be waning to some degree. I don't know. Dan? As uh, Sire points out, it's affected every every dimension of scholarship. Uh, not that the most prized scholars have this perspective, but in terms of discipline, psychology, philosophy, politics, um, you have writers that are pretty well established in these areas. Personal spirituality and all the rest. The materials out there. I mean, let me give you one example. I have this book called Spirituality for Dummies that someone in the bookstore several years ago got for free and gave to me. And it's, it's all New Age. It's all actually non-dualism. It's Advaita Vedanta Hinduism, which is the default mode for spirituality in America, basically. Here's a little exercise. I haven't become one with Brahmin, so I have to adjust my glasses to be able to read it. <laughs> the following exercise gives you practice in repeating a mantra-like phrase as a tool for spiritual growth. This one is in English, so you can experience how the meaning of a mantra can help lead you into deeper, more profound states of awareness. Don't do this, by the way. Close your eyes and contemplate this affirmation of universal truth. It's all connected. <laughs> Repeat it silently to yourself with each in-breath and with each out-breath. Okay, so... It's all connected. It's all connected. It's all connected. It's all connected. You know, if you do that wrongly, you might hyperventilate and you might have to call 911. So... Oh, silently. <laughs> How do you say it silently? How do you say it silently? Well, silently to yourself. Okay, you don't, you don't vocalize. I blew it. Sometimes in meditation, people try to quiet their mind and suppress whatever thoughts and ideas come to pass by. However, in this exercise, every image that comes up can become the very object of your contemplation. Whatever thoughts come to mind, look at them and, and reaffirm it's all connected. You don't even need, you don't even uh, have to try to figure out exactly how it's connected. <clears throat> Just allow the words, this should sound familiar if you read what Cyrus said about Om. Just allow the words to sift through your mind and heart into the place inside you that already knows. Of course that it's all connected. Open up your own wise soul. And you've got this little summary 
of spirituality. <clears throat> what spirituality can do for you? Spirituality gives you greater appreciation for everything in your life. Gives you more consciousness of the bigger picture. Brings you more power along with the intuition on how to guide that power. Spirituality brings you to a place of independent con- contentment. Spirituality is the key to overcoming sor- sorrow. Spirituality encourages honesty and self-acceptance. Spirituality, spirituality reveals that everything you seek outside yourself is right inside. Is that compatible with what you believe? No. Spirituality makes your limited identification dissolve and expand into greater fields of awareness. Lastly, spirituality helps you remember that it is all God, even when it doesn't feel like God. You should be able to identify this pretty quickly. It's non-dualistic Hinduism, with an American spin on being positive and self-actualized. Now, as I said, this is an intellectual question. This is a worldview, and the worldview needs to be critiqued. And it often is not. But I want to just try to very briefly emphasize that this is also a spiritual battle. And having written several books on this and having gone to New Age events, handing out tracts, talking to people, giving lectures on college campuses on Buddhism, comparative religion, the uniqueness of Christ, and so on, you have to have your chops down intellectually. You have to know what your worldview is, why you believe it. You need to know what the other worldviews are and why people believe them. And you have to be able to criticize those worldviews lovingly and intelligently. But you need to have an orientation that this is war. You're at war. You're not at war with other people. They're the victims. But you're at war with the powers of darkness, Satan and demons and the world system. And so if you have the truth and you have a forum to present the truth, let's say some kind of a campus Bible study or some kind of an outreach talk or you go to a New Age event and hand out tracts, you better be ready for hostility. Everything going wrong. Before you want to do this, you start to get sick. You get into terrible arguments with your best friends or your spouse. Your car breaks down mysteriously. The printing machine you were going to use for the tracks mysteriously goes bad. You have to go to another one. Does this sound familiar to any of you? Some of you know what I'm talking about. You just take this for granted in this area of apologetics. And it certainly applies to Islam as well. The two talks or three talks I've given on Islam the past two years have been terrible battles even to get them out. Because Islam is such an is such a powerful spiritual stronghold in this world. So anytime you come against something that's uh, dark and well-established, you have to know how to fight. And I want to read you a passage from Acts 13. I'll just make some very quick points about this, but how Barnabas and Saul dealt with spiritual warfare and give you a few directives or pointers here. This is from Acts 13. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, uh, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Very multi-ethnic, fascinating group. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they were sent off. Now what's important here is that for mission, you need backup. You need a commission to do mission. You need somebody behind you who knows you and knows your strengths and knows your weaknesses. And you need to follow the Lord. They're worshiping the Lord. And the direction came from the Holy Spirit to go on this mission. So you don't just show up at a New Age event unprepared or without prayer or without a strategy or without without some background. Verse 4, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. Notice how many times the Holy Spirit's mentioned these passages went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to uh, Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. So they're proclaiming not themselves, but the word of God. And John is there not as a teacher, but as a helper. When you do these sorts of outreaches, you need the people who are going to talk and the people are going to shut up and pray. Really, you need sometimes for these kinds of events, people just to show up and pray. They're not particularly the ones that may be engaging people or giving the talk or talking to the unbelievers on the street. They're just there to pray. Or people home are just there to pray. You need helpers for these sorts of outreaches. 
And the helpers are just import, as important as the big mouse. So, verse 6, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant to the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. So here's an opening. Here's an influential man who wants to hear the word of God. But there's also an obstacle, and he's a sorcerer. He's an occultist. And it was common in that day for political leaders to have basically a secretary of sorcery to give them advice. So this character, Bar-Jesus, uh, also known as a sorcerer, realizes that if they hear the word of God, then he's probably out of a job. He's probably in trouble. So there's some conflict. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Now, there's so much there. I think we can take a lot of principles from this passage. One of them is to be prepared to pray, to be commissioned, to have people behind you and people with you to support you, to know the word of God, proclaim the word of God, not something else, not yourself. And then also to be prepared. This is true of apologetics in general, but I found it to be definitely a hot issue when you do any kind of outreach to people in other religions or into the occult. You have to be ready for resistance. The resistance can come in any number of ways. I mentioned a few of them. All of a sudden not feeling well ahead of time, getting into disputes with people you care about and love and usually get along with just fine, having mechanical problems, having people try to dissuade you from doing what you're doing. There are a lot of ways that you can be resisted. Now, it may not be a person coming up to you and saying, go away, like bar Jesus. Oh, that does happen. I, I, did, I have not handed out tracts really for quite some time. I like to give lectures to audiences now as opposed to handing out tracts. But in my day, I've done a lot of handing out of tracts and I've written up tracts and handed it out to people and put my phone number on it so they could call me about it. And I've had some interesting conversations about that. But I remember one time, about 1981, uh, Carlos Santana came to the University of Oregon and he was a follower of a guru at that time named Sri Chin Moy. And Carlos went to do sort of a devotional concert for Sri Chin Moy. I thought, well, here's a good opportunity to hand out some tracts. So I copied a tract. It was a testimony of a guru named uh, Ravi Maharaj who had come to Christ. And it was in this nice form in a uh, newsletter. So I copied it, folded it over, made up about 100 or 200. And I was supposed to go there with a friend of mine and we were going to hand out tracts before this event. Now, for whatever reason, my friend never showed up. <clears throat> so I was by myself with all these tracts. So I was handing out tracts to people and this woman came up to me and looked at me and said, Oh, my God! And then she ran away. I thought, well, this is a religious response. So I kept handing out tracts. And then somebody came up to me and said, You can't do that. You can't hand out tracts here. It's against the rules. I said, No, it's not true. I checked. And as long as I, I don't disturb the flow of people into the auditorium, it's not against the rules of the university. I checked these things out ahead of time. I said, Well, but you're not supposed to do it. And I said, I can do it. There's no problem. So I did it. I handed out the tracts. In fact, Carlos Santana was there tuning up his guitar. And I handed one to him. And he said famously, no thanks, man. So I didn't get through to Carlos. But <laughs> I, did, I did hand out about 200 tracks. Now, what was the result? I don't know. I don't think anybody called me on that one. But the point is that they tried to stop me. I think there were actually three levels of people that tried to stop me. And the verse that kept coming to my mind was, stand firm in the faith. So I said, no, it's not illegal. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not telling anybody not to go in. I just have a different perspective on what's going on. And I did it. That, that's pretty small resistance, really. But when you do this kind of thing, you will get resistant. And what you have to do is try to press through. Try to press on when you get the resistance. Not just give up. You know, I say, well, it must not be the Lord's will because it's being opposed. Sometimes it's opposed because it is the Lord's will. As in this case, right? So we may have our people to deal with, our sorcerers, so to speak. <clears throat> Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Note that reference again. And don't try this at home without the Holy Spirit. Don't try this in public without the Holy Spirit. Look straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? A question he never had a chance to answer. Verse 11. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. 
You might be thinking, where's the apologetics here? We don't have any record of apologetics. This is what you call what? A power encounter. The power of darkness comes against the power of truth. And the power of the gospel. And so you have to be fortified and prepared for resistance. They were going to communicate the gospel to Sergius Paulus. That may have involved some apologetics. We don't know. But his secretary of sorcery didn't even want it to get off the ground. He wanted to stop it. And so what Paul did, filled with the Holy Spirit, please notice that, commissioned by the church, led by the Spirit, proclaiming the Word of God, not himself. He had a helper there who I'm sure was praying the whole time. John Mark, right? He had the courage to face down the obstacle. Now, I'm not saying you're going to have a situation that's a lot like this where someone's going to uh, come against you and you pronounce a curse upon them. But who knows? It might happen. It might. The Holy Spirit might lead you to do something like that. It's never happened to me. But the equivalent, or I should say something similar has happened, and that is you're trying to present the truth in a loving, fair, rational way, and obstacles come in your face. You need these principles. I mean, the last time I preached this, I think I came up with about eight principles, but all I have here is a Godward orientation is needed for discerning your calling in ministry and to receive, receive power over error. You need the wisdom of the church to discern your call in life to find power over error. You need to know the Word of God. You need to know the power of error opposes the truth. And you should trust that God's work and God's way will find God's strength in those sort of situations. So this comes from somebody who converted out of this basic worldview and who has been thinking about it and writing about it and teaching about it and preaching about it and evangelizing and doing apologetics for almost 30 years. I warn you, you get into this area, you have trouble. Anybody say amen? Some of you know this already. Most of you know this already. But if you don't, I'm just warning you. But whoever said Christianity was without trouble? Whoever said following Christ was simple, easy, or fun all the time? It's not. So get over it and get ready if you have your chops in order. Now, some people, I mean, there are two equal and opposite errors to steal a felicitous phrase from C.S. Lewis. One is, I've got all the arguments. I've studied this. I know the New Age worldview better than the New Agers and I've got seven points to refute them. I don't have to worry about prayer support, fasting. I just go out there and give them the arguments. Whammo, you're dead meat. The other approach is the hyper-charismatic approach. Oh, Jesus said not to prepare ahead of time. The Holy Spirit will tell us what to say and that's all rationalism and this other guy tells me it's modernism anyway, which is bad. So we don't have to worry about arguments and and worldview and negative apologetics and all that stuff that hurts my brain anyway. We'll just go out there and trust the Holy Spirit to to do what's right. Whammo, you get clobbered. You get clobbered on both sides. What do you need? Smart people filled with the Holy Spirit. By smart, I mean well-informed. I don't mean necessarily academics. I mean people that know what's going on and are ready for a fight. Can you say amen? Amen. Good. 